Um, what a blessing. So anyhow, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, those that may be coming in late, I pray that you would just get them here safely. Lord, we pray for Kevin, who had an accident, um, injured himself, Lord, that he'd be okay. We also lift up Dr. Robinson, who's battling with some sickness. Also lift up Pansy, who's battling with some sickness. And Lord, for all those that are traveling, Lord, I pray that you get them back safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, this is the second installment of the Fruit of the Spirit. You're going to be hearing from some different teachers uh, throughout this series, but today I'm going to cover the first two. Now, last week I kind of introduced the fruit of the Spirit when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches, apart from me you can do nothing, and then he said that we need to bear fruit. But what did he say he would do when we began to bear fruit? What did he say, Tim? He said he was going to start pruning. And why did he say he was going to start pruning? To bear much fruit or greater fruit. So Jesus is basically making a statement that beware, Christian, you are never going to arrive. You are never going to get to a place where you say, oh, I've made it. Now I can sit back and rest on my laurels. God's been good to me. I'm just going to enjoy the rest of my life and put it in cruise control. We do not have that option. We must always be prepared to grow. What did Jesus say he would do to a branch if it stopped bearing fruit? See, there's two different types of cutters. There's your pruning shears. That's those little guys that fit in the palm of your hand, right? And you just kind of cut around little things, and you do that to kind of trim it down so that the fruit will come in full, right? But then there's these things called loppers. Now, what do you do with the loppers? You cut off dead branches or branches that aren't bearing any fruit. So you get to choose what instrument Jesus uses on you. He can either use the pruning shears or he can use the loppers. And uh, if he uses the loppers, that's a bad deal because it says he'll cut you off. And what does the Bible say will be done with the branches that are cut off? It says they'll be burned up. So we, we live in a arrival mentality, don't we? It's like, I want to get to this place. And once I've arrived to this place, then I can rest. Then I can stop. And that's not the way it is in our spiritual journey. God is limitless, and God is incapable of being found out. The Bible says his ways are past finding out, which basically means he's this endless mystery that you can always discover more and more and more and more and more of him. And the more we discover with him, the more we bear fruit. And then last week, one thing Jesus said, you'd be able to tell the difference between those who were with him and those who were in opposition with him by their fruit. Because I see a lot of people that call themselves Christians. And I see a lot of people that don't bear fruit. Um, in our home group Sunday evening, something very interesting came out of that. And what came out of that was this. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is, is Lord, you shall be saved. And it was interesting because it, what if it only said if you believe in your heart? What if that's all you had to do was believe? What would that produce? Because what's the Bible say? It says that even demons believe. So see, belief is not enough. It has to come out of your mouth. That's why it says in 1 John that anyone who does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is of the Antichrist. Remember, we talked about that last week. It has to come out of your mouth. Out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart speaks, the Scripture says. So what comes out of our mouth determines what's in our heart. Now, we all know that we can lie and we can make things up and we can pretend, but eventually your mouth will tell on you. Eventually what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. And I just thought that was important because belief is not enough. It has to come out of our mouth, and that produces fruit. And we have to be bearing fruit. Now, we talked last week about what the fruit of the Spirit is. I want to read that again in Galatians chapter 2, or 5, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
So if you have these things in you and they're coming out of you, then you don't need a law to tell you the difference between right and wrong. Because if you're walking in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you don't need the fourth commandment to tell you to, to set aside a day for God. If you have these things in your life, you don't need to tell uh, the law to tell you to love, to have joy. These things are, not, it's like, it's, for example, you don't have to tell a peach tree to bear peaches. It's going to do it naturally, right? Because that's what it is. So we don't have to tell a Christian, well, you need to be more loving. If, if a Christian is not loving, then there's something wrong in their walk with God. There's something wrong with their relationship to the Holy Spirit. It goes on, it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, that's a whole different set of teaching right there. And my plan for this series was to actually do two parts of an introduction. I was going to teach today on the works of the flesh to kind of help us to understand these things are manifestations of a person who does not have the Spirit of God in them. When you have the Spirit of God in you, you have these manifestations. Unfortunately, as we were putting the teaching series together, we fell a week short before July, so I had to cut that out and jump straight into this. So uh, I do apologize for that. But I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And I want you to take note of the similarities here. And I want you to take note of what this produces. It says, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now that alone is some good stuff. It's His power that gives us all we need to live a godly life. We don't need anything else. That's all we need is the power of God, active and at work in our life. The Spirit of God working in our, and that's why this Holy Spirit conference is important, because we need the Spirit of God working in us. When the Spirit of God is working in us, then we have all we need to live a godly life. You want, you know what I automatically think when someone comes to me and says, Pastor, is it a sin if I blank? You know what my first thought is? You obviously don't have the Spirit of God. Because if you have the Spirit of God, you would need to ask that question because His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Either that or you're coming to me because you know it's wrong. The Spirit is already convicting you, but you want me to defy the Holy Spirit and tell you it's okay so that you can blame me for the wrong that you do. Right? It's either one or the other. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes. He says, whatever is not a faith is sin. And he goes on and talks about the fact that, I believe it's partially in Romans. Some of that's in Romans where it talks about food sacrificed to idols. And if it violates your conscience or if it makes a brother stumble, then don't do it. But there's a, there's a lot in the scripture where it talks about basically if it, it can be wrong for you simply because it makes you have a guilty conscience. So uh, stay away from it. But the Spirit of God, oh, if we would just develop a relationship. The Spirit of God is a person. It's not a thing. It's not an it. It's not a power. It's not a light at the end of the tunnel. It is a person. It is a person that we can have a relationship with. It's a person that we can grieve. It's a person who has feelings and emotions. The Holy Spirit is a person. No, it's not a human but it is a person in the sense that it has personal qualities and it, it behaves in a personal kind of way. It feelings and, and the Holy Spirit can be quenched. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Um, there's, there's, so when we recognize the Holy Spirit is a person rather than a power that exudes from God, it is God. It is a person. And I think it helps us understand we need to build a relationship with him, not it. I remember back in the day when they had revivals, they would always say, something's got a hold on me. And oh, someone has got a hold on you. It's a person. And if we recognize that, then I think we would be more apt to receive the benefits from him, which is 
everything we need. If we could just grasp that, his divine power has granted me everything I need to live a godly life. Lord, I thank you for pastors. I thank you for teachers, prophets, evangelists. Lord, I thank you for the people you put in my life. But, Lord, if I don't have your spirit, what I want, Lord, is a relationship with your spirit. Lord, I want you to guide me. Because, see, the pastor isn't always there. The teacher isn't always there. Sometimes the evangelist won't answer the phone. Right? So we need the Holy Spirit who is always there. You remember that song, Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Call him up. Remember, because he's, he's there all the time. So, goodness gracious, just that portion of verse 3 is worth the price of admission. The Holy Spirit is all I need to live a godly life. I'm thankful for people that he's put in my life. I'm thankful that I have the challenge of knowing I'm being held accountable by a person other than God, by a human but if I don't have the Holy Spirit, do you realize without the Holy Spirit, even the Word of God is ineffective? As a matter of fact, to prove it, I don't know where it is, but it's in one of the Gospels where the Pharisees are quoting Scriptures to Jesus. He says, you look to the Scriptures as if they have life in them, and you don't even realize they are speaking about me. See, without the revelation of the Holy Spirit, no, why do you think we have dead religion? Why do you think we have people that have rules and regulations in the name of God, but there's no power? It's because they have absenced themselves from the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. It says, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers in the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire. So what this is saying is each of us have a sinful desire, the flesh, as they used to say back in the old King James days. The flesh, that thing in us that wants to do wrong, that thing in us that wants to fulfill all the things I, I intended to teach today. Lasciviousness and sexual sin and all, all kinds of different things. All these things we want to do in our own nature. But when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, he changes our nature and he makes us partakers in the divine nature. So not only does the Holy Spirit give us everything that we need to live a godly life, he also makes us partakers with his nature. All of a sudden, I take on the nature of the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, I become more like him. All of a sudden, I have a relationship with him to where I become more like he is. And then it goes on, and it says, for this very reason. Now, what reason are we talking about? Because we have divine power to live a godly life, and we have... Uh, participation in divine nature. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Now, I, I want to point out something. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The first one is faith. Now, we do know that faith and faithfulness are two different things. However, faith and faithfulness are correlated. It says, with your virtue, or add your faith with virtue, and virtue is the same thing as goodness. And with your virtue, knowledge, with knowledge, self-control, obviously mentioned directly in both. And with self-control, steadfastness, which is the same thing as patience. And with steadfastness, godliness. And with godliness, brotherly affection. With brotherly affection, love. Brotherly affection is the same thing as kindness, Philadelphia. And love, obviously, is the same thing as love. Now listen, it says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful, which we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Pardon me for a minute. My humanity is showing up tonight. So if you have these qualities and they're increasing, they'll keep you from being unfruitful. They'll keep you from being ineffective. Uh, but it says, if you lack these, you're nearsighted and blind, having forgotten you were cleansed from your former sins. 
And see, there, there's so, such an abundance of stuff in here. He's saying, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have his divine power that gives you everything you need to live a godly life. And you're participants in his divine nature, which comes with fruit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, and goodness, gentleness. And all of these things are in you now, and they should be increasing. And as they grow, they keep you from being unfruitful. They keep you from being ineffective. Uh, I shared something this morning that uh, the Lord kind of revealed to me as I was in the balcony praying. A couple weeks ago, I had some drainage problems in my backyard. Basically, what happened is the kids were playing on the playground. I noticed a, a little mud patch was starting to form. And it hadn't rained in a few weeks. And I was like, or a, few, or a couple weeks. And I was like, what's going on here? So uh, I didn't think anything of it. And then it rained. And then we had something that weekend, and the rain had cleared off. The sun had, you know, dried up the ground, except that one spot, but it was different. It became like a marsh. You, I, I stepped in it and nearly lost my shoe. My, my entire foot went in the ground, and I was like, okay, something is going on because it hasn't rained in two or three days. So me being the person I am, we were having a birthday party. They were singing happy birthday to my daughter, and I had a shovel digging up the yard trying to figure out what was going on because I just can't let things just like to just sit. And then I discovered there was a corrugated pipe, one of those larger ones, that had been buried in my backyard. And everybody knows what happens if you bury a drain pipe, right? If you bury a drain pipe, it gets stopped, and it'll soak in the ground until the ground can't contain it anymore. This house is 13 years old. So for 13 years, that drain pipe seemed ineffective in its ability to get the top of the ground wet because it was all going down. But as it rained and rained and rained and rained, and that moisture just kept building and building and building and building, it eventually had nowhere to go but up. Right? And uh, that's what created that problem. And that's the way it is with us sometimes. Sometimes we feel ineffective and the enemy tries to discourage us saying, oh, your efforts are not paying any dividends. You've been praying, you've been seeking God, and look at you, you're still stuck in this same spot, and you're still doing this. But what you don't realize is you're making a difference in things you can't see. Because see, that ground, there was a part of that ground I couldn't see that was creating a problem I didn't even know was coming. And I'm not saying God creates problems, but what I am saying is sometimes your efforts are working under the stuff, right? It seemed like overnight my ground turned into a marsh. And eventually overnight you're going to see progress. It's going to seem overnight. right? You know there's no such thing as an as a overnight success. Somebody put in the work. It took time. So just whenever you feel ineffective, remind yourself, I've got everything I need to live a godly life. I am a participant in the divine nature. And I have the fruit of the Spirit growing into me. And eventually it's going to rise to the surface and I'm going to be able to overcome this situation. I'm going to be strong. I think there's a lot of people that get discouraged right when they're to the point of breakthrough. Right when they're to the point where the water is going to burst forth from the ground and be free. Because that, that water had a desire. What was its desire? To be able to run free, right? But it was being blocked. And it was working under the surface and working under the surface. And finally, it created a problem for me, but the water achieved its objective. It was free. So you may feel bound up. You may feel blocked. But eventually, if you continue to pray, if you continue to seek God, if you continue to develop a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, you're going to achieve breakthrough. So long story short, I spent the evening with a shovel digging a trench all the way down to my fence went and bought 25 feet of corrugated pipe and created a French drain at the, right at the edge of my fence. So now it drains downhill into the sewer. Be free, water. Go ahead. Have fun. Um, just don't tear up my yard no more. This says, whoever lacks these things is nearsighted, so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. How many of y'all want to sign up for that? I want assurance of my salvation. 
I want to know that I'm never going to fall. So what do I do? Build a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. You wake up in the morning and you talk to the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, you don't get anywhere without Jesus. Understand, they're all one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're one God. So don't get hung up on technical terms, but it's just build a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. God, he's the one that lives in you. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that lives in you. So build a relationship with him. and Let him grow you. Let him produce his fruit through you. Now listen, it says, For in this way there will be a richly provide, uh, provided inheritance for you at the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. See, here, here's what I believe. There was a time when I first got saved because it was taught to me this way that I believed you could have no certainty of your salvation, that my salvation was 100% dependent upon me. Any mistake I made, anything I did wrong, and the Holy Spirit left me. And I had to get myself back to that altar, and I had to get myself right with God because I didn't want to go to hell. And I lived like that for a few years. Riding on the horns of the altar, terrified that one mistake was going to be the one where God wouldn't come back, where the Holy Spirit wouldn't come back. I don't know how I got that thinking. It's probably a result of some of the teaching that I sat under. Who, who, who knows how I got that? But I'll never forget when I got the understanding that my salvation is a partnership. I do my part, but God has done his part. And as long as I stay in relationship with him, he will work with me through my faults. That's called sanctification. I'm growing. I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger. I'm not perfect. Because, I, see, I figured out something one day. I figured, you know, I've never met a person that's perfect. Now, if I've never met a person that's perfect, that means, A, nobody can know whether or not they're saved. Or B, there's something wrong in my understanding. Because his word says, his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm his kid. And I knew I was God's kid. I knew I had been saved. I knew I was the man, I, 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 I was a different man than I had been before. So I began to question this loosey-goosey, save, loss, save, loss, save, loss, save, loss, based on the fact that I messed up. And I didn't go all the way to eternal security to where no matter what I do, no matter how I live, I'm going to be saved because I'm a good old Baptist boy. And I, I said the sinner's prayer when I was 12. So therefore, I can live however I want. And I'm still going to go to heaven. No, I didn't go to that extreme either. But I didn't go to the extreme that my salvation is lost every time I make a mistake. Build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And then you can know. Because if you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, He is going to challenge you. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you're bearing fruit, I'm still going to prune you. Because I want you to bear much fruit. So, once I got that revelation, things didn't get a whole lot easier. I still had to struggle. I still had to grow. I still had to learn. But I did those things with security, knowing, you know what, my foundation is secure. My faith is in Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I'm God's kid. He loves me. I'm firm in him. And it, it released me from having to work out my salvation to begin able to work on my growth. Does that make sense? In other words, I didn't go back to the foundation getting saved over and over again. I was actually focused on now I want to become more like him. I want to grow in my relationship with him. Uh, it was talked about last week that uh, in the Old Testament, it was more about what's right and what's wrong. In the New Testament, it's more about growing in him and becoming more like him. So I just thank God for that revelation. But I want to cover two of the nine fruit of the Spirit today. Love and joy. And these two are very deeply connected. Actually, they're all very deeply connected. But the word love is the Greek word agape. And what it means is caring and seeking the highest good of others without any motive for personal gain. Now, I'm going to say that again. Caring and seeking the highest good of others without any motive for personal gain. So, love means I am putting the good of everyone else above myself and I don't want to get anything out of it. Anything I get out of it is based out of the goodness of God. 
but my desire is for the good of others, even if it costs me personally. Now, is that what we here love to find as in the world today? Because if love was the reason people got married, how many marriages would end in a divorce? None. Because I'm always going to put the other person before myself, even if it inconveniences me. Even if I lose. Even if the other person wins and I lose. Because I love them. And see, that is the purest definition of love. The Bible says that God is love, which we'll get to in a minute. So if God is love, and God is good, and God is perfect, then we know that love in its purest form comes from Him. And see, here, here's an interesting thing about God. God is infinite. God is eternal. So what does that mean about His love? It's infinite, and it's eternal. So there's no end to it. It's perfect to infinity. It's perfect to to eternity. There's no end to its perfection. His love isn't like ours. It isn't stained. It isn't hampered by sin. See, God is holy. And the word holy just simply means he's set apart. He's independent from his creation. So even though his creation became corrupted through sin, God did not. So his love did not. There is no selfishness in God. He always seeks the good for his creation. So since love is an attribute, which means a quality that God possesses, we can take courage in knowing that he can teach us to love through the Holy Spirit living in us. So think about this. If the Holy Spirit lives in us and the Holy Spirit is God and God is love, then what do we have living inside of us? Love. Right? So that means we can grow in that. Because again, remember God's love is eternal and it's infinite, but we're not. We're limited. So that means we are incapable of becoming as loving as God. We're incapable of of becoming as selfless as God. So that tells us that our love can always grow. We never arrive. Romans 5, 1, 5. Romans 5 is probably one of my favorite chapters. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And goodness, the grace in which we stand, that's a whole different teaching. Because some people confuse grace and mercy. See, mercy is when we deserve punishment and God does not give it to us. Grace is God's unmerited favor. That means God gives us favor even though we don't deserve it. It's the ground on which we stand. We stand on the fact that we have the favor of God. Now, a lot of people say, well, um, grace is, is a safety net, not a sidewalk. And I don't agree with that statement. Mercy is a safety net, not a sidewalk. In other words, I don't want to say, well, I have the favor of God because of his grace, so I'm going to sin. And then I'm going to ask for forgiveness because God's merciful. It's a dangerous game to play. This is, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. I think we could word it like this. Not only that we rejoice in our pruning, knowing that our pruning produces endurance, Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love, listen to this, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit he has given to us. So when we become God's children, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're his kids. And his spirit pours his love into our hearts. We have a constant supply of love. Now, the world has a very confused definition of love. Can some people give me some examples of what the world's definition of love is? Tim, go ahead. Okay, sexual. A lot of times it is sexual. And actually, there is a Greek word called eros, 
which means love in a sexual way. It's a romantic love. Yes, Andrew, and then I'll get to you. Okay, yes, love is a feeling. I uh, get butterflies in my stomach. I saw a joke today that I thought was so funny. Instead of butterflies fall in love, do they get people in their stomach? I thought it was hilarious. Um, you, you can take that home and do whatever you want to with it. I thought it was great. Um, Chad, go ahead. Okay, m- m- materialism, I love things. I love pizza. I love beans. I love, you know, chicken and long walks in the park and, and those things. But there's something I'm looking for that today people really confuse love with. There you go. Acceptance or agreement. In other words, if you love me, you'll agree with me. Uh, The homosexual community uses it a lot. It's not very loving to call out sin, they say. Well, let me ask you a question. If you knew that your backyard was full of vipers, and the grass was kind of tall, and your children could not really tell they were back there, and you saw them running toward those vipers, would it be loving to say, oh, I'm just going to accept them the way they are? Or would the more loving thing be to go and get them and say, no, there's danger out there. Those things will kill you. So isn't it the same? Sin is like a viper. Sin is destructive. It is deadly. It is hurtful to the person. So to tell them what you're doing is wrong is actually an act of love. See, the world has confused love to the point that I can't say anything that makes you feel bad, which ties back to what Andrew said, feelings, which ties back to what Chad said, which is, uh, I, my, my train of thought got material things, yes. Yes, they've reversed it. They've said it's hateful. How many times have you heard the word bigotry and hatred used when it comes to someone telling them, no, you can't do this? If you remember, I can't remember what county it was, but the lady that was the county clerk that refused to issue the marriage license. She was painted as this hateful, mean, nasty, ornery person when the only thing she said is, this violates my conscience. We, have, we had a bakery shut down because they wouldn't make a cake for a... Uh, A gay couple, when they had served them cakes all the other times and treated them good, we have turned love into hate in this world. But love is truly seeking the highest good of others, even if you get nothing out of it. Even if it costs you dearly. And God, love, I I love this, was poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians gives us the greatest description of love in the entire Bible. Uh, we hear this read at weddings often. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because Pentecostals, that we run a risk of elevating the gifts over love. Because I will tell you something. There are some mean Pentecostals out there. Speak in tongues by day and rip you up one side and down the other by night. And Paul wants to address that issue. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What's he saying there? Love is more important than tongues. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith. Now, you notice he's listing the gifts of the Spirit. Are you noticing this? But have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So the first thing he does is he establishes that love is greater than any experience we have. Love is greater than any gift that we possess. And then he goes on to define it. To find it, Listen to what he says. Love is patient. And you'll start noticing the fruit of the Spirit in here. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. How many times do we get frustrated and behave rudely towards someone we love? And see, that's because it's not stemming from the Spirit of God. It's stemming from the flesh. I wish I could have taught on that thing on the flesh, but we just didn't have the extra week. You're going to have to go read it yourself. Because Christians can get in the flesh. Amen? 
We can get in ourselves. We can stop relying on the Holy Spirit and we can get in ourselves. And then that requires some work for us. Lord, I want myself to decrease so that you can increase. It does not insist on its own way. Wow. It does not insist on its own way. It's not demanding. do not say, well, if you don't do this, and I won't do this. No, I'm going to love you no matter what you do. I'm going to love you even when you hate me. I'm going to love you even when you mistreat me. I'm not, I don't have to have my way. Wow. It goes on. I'm trying to sneeze. Everybody say, don't sneeze. It's supposed to be some kind of a scientific thing that stops it from coming. I'm really battling up here, so pray for me. I think it worked. Thank you, babe. No, I don't need that. I, I, I'm definitely not shooting nasal spray in front of these people. That's, that is not going to happen. We'll just have to work it out. It's not rude. It doesn't insist in its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. So think about this. When you're being impatient, unkind, boastful, arrogant, rude, insistent on having things your own way, when you're irritable and resentful, you're not walking in love. Wow. That means you're allowing the flesh to be in control. We all do it, don't we? We get frustrated. Gosh, it's so easy to get frustrated. In fact, just a couple of days ago, if I want to snitch on myself, one thing I try to be is who I am. I don't try to fake you all out from the pulpit. We were building, uh, what was it, the screen for the, the box garden. And we had this mesh stuff. We didn't get chicken wire. We cheaped out because, you know, we didn't want to spend the money on the chicken wire. We got the cheaper, meshy stuff. I don't know if you ever worked that stuff. It's a pain. And my wife and I were trying to stretch it over. It's getting hung up on everything. I started getting frustrated. And she said something to kind of correct me, you know, aren't you a joy to work with or something like that. And it kind of stings when that happens because then it points out my flesh. And then my flesh wants to react even more. Oh, yeah, well, you, you're not a day in the park yourself. How about that? What you got to say now? And I have to check myself. And then when the project was over, I said, sorry, babe, I was, I was being kind of irritable. It's not a product of love. Love takes work. Having a relationship with the Holy Spirit takes work. Because I am flawed. If I want a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but you know what? I want to grow to the place to where my wife and I can build a 710-piece playground with the tools they provide and not the fancy ones in the garage and us not have a fight. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. We can... We can barely build a table without fussing right now because it's just, you, you know when love is the most difficult to express? When you're not in your element. When you're struggling with something. When you're doing something you know you're not good at because you're starting to get that frustration. And what I should have done when I was seeing that irritation build up is I should have said, Lord, I want a relationship with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk in love. Help me to walk in love. It's an opportunity to learn. And here's the thing. If you blow it, don't beat yourself up. Just say, sorry I got irritated. And guess what? Love was restored. Amen? Build on it. Grow in it. Understand it's going to happen. We are imperfect people. Probably not going to get a whole lot of handshakes today. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all may get that. Some of you may not. But I am battling up here. Uh, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man, this is some good stuff. In other words, because I am a person of love, when another person fails, I'm not the one there saying, ha, see, I told you, if you would have listened to me, you wouldn't be in this situation. Love doesn't gloat in the fact that someone messed up. Can I get a witness? Am I the only one that has to keep my flesh in check sometimes and say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to love. Help me to not rejoice when the first person finally gets what they deserve. I told you it was coming. Ha! Huh? Help me, Jesus. It 
does not rejoice at wrong, it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things, hopes in all things. And I feel like I skipped something. but Because somewhere in there it says love keeps no record of wrongs. Yes. Love is patient, kind, does not envy, boast, does not insist in its own way, not irritable, resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. For where there is prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, a lot of people miss what that's talking about. What he's saying here is these gifts that God gave us, discernment, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, faith, wisdom, knowledge, healing, miracles, all these things, one day they're going to stop because the perfect is going to come. Jesus is going to come. But, and I know many people misunderstand that part. But I think the part they miss the most is this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. You know what that's saying? We don't know everything. Even when we're functioning in our gifts, we only have partial knowledge. So there is no room for arrogance. There is no room for boasting. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And I, when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But when then face to face... Now I know in part, but then I'll know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now listen to what it says. It says, now, so now faith and hope and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So Paul's point here is, look, even if I am operating in my gift, whether it be prophecy, tongues, interpretation, whatever it is, there's still things I don't know. So the greatest thing I can do is express God's love the best way I know how. And again, love is putting the well-being of others before yourself, no matter what the cost is. Now, Jesus demonstrated this in a real way. There's two scriptures I really enjoy that talk about God's love. One of them is one of the most cliche ones out there, John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The second one says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The reason I like these two things is, number one, it says God so loved the world. That means God loves ISIS. That means God loves those that are trapped in Buddhism. God loves the atheists. In North Korea, God loves the communist, the people that we say we're supposed to hate, right? And see, some people confuse war with hate. War is to protect things you love. It's not to spread hate. But God loved the world, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every type of person in the world. That means everyone in it, people that are awful. God loved them. He wants what's best for them, even if it cost him dearly. And it cost him his own son. And the second one I love, it says, but God shows his love for, th- for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he loves terrorists while they're terrorists. Now I'm using the extreme example Because God loved me while I was addicted. God loved my old self. He loved me enough that he gave his only son to give me an opportunity to love him in return. It's an act of faith. When I put my faith in Jesus and confess him with my mouth, then I become a Christian, a child of God. So he loves us in whatever condition we're in. He died for the worst of sinners. You do realize that Jesus died for those he knew would reject him? He died for the ones he knew would say no. That's powerful stuff. 
Because the Bible says, I think it's in John. It says, rarely for a good man will someone die. But God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were bad people. Think about that for a minute. Is that how, is that how the world operates? If you're a bad person, do they extend love toward you? As a matter of fact, anymore, even if you're a good person, they don't extend love toward you. What really fascinates me is the tolerance police are the least tolerant people I know. Those that run around crying that we're intolerant, they tolerate. Do, do you see Christians going around shutting down gay bakeries? I mean, tell me how this makes sense. We're not demanding those businesses be closed because they won't make us heterosexual cakes. We don't care. Right? Go be whatever it is you want to be. God still loves you. I'm still going to share his love with you. And if that makes you mad, then I'm going to do what's best for you, even if it hurts me. That's why Christians end up persecuted. That's why Christians end up in prison. That's why Christians end up losing jobs and, and different things. is because they refuse to allow anything but God's love to pour through them. Because remember, it's being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever read the story of Stephen? Remember, it's around Acts chapter 6, 7, 8, where it says they were furious with him, and they began to stone him. Pelting rocks, and he looks up into heaven. And he basically says, Father, don't hold this against them. They don't know. Has anybody ever wondered, how did he do that? How did he how in the world can you be getting pelted with rocks and be okay with it? Because what do they teach us now? You catch one of them suckers and you throw it right back. Right? Jesus said, turn the other cheek. That story has always fascinated me. It's like what faith and love he must have had for God to be able to endure that. So then the second thing is joy. Now this comes from the word chara, which is where we get the word charity. So that kind of gives you an idea of what joy is. It's, it's also giving. But now joy is more of a feeling than love is. Love is an action. Love is what you are. But joy is defined as a feeling of gladness independent of ourselves. It's based on the fact that God loves us, extends his grace to us, blesses us, keeps his promise to us, and is near us at all times. Because God is faithful in every way, we can have joy no matter the circumstance. Now I want you to just let that sink in. Joy is a feeling of gladness independent of anything that happens to me. It is solely based on the fact that God loves me, he's gracious to me, he blesses me, he keeps his promises, and he's close to me. I can take joy in knowing that. As long as I know that God loves me, as long as I know that I have access to God's grace, as long as I know that he's going to bless me, that he keeps his promises, and that he's near me, what do I have to not be joyous about? Because do those things change? See, the Bible says that God doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, I, 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 the Lord, changeth not. He does not change. He stays the same. He's dependable. I know some people that they're up one day and down the next and are dependable one day and they're not the next. And one day they're there for you and the next day they're not. And God's not that way. He's unchanging. So I can take joy in knowing that he's always going to love me. He's always going to extend grace to me. He's always going to bless me. He's always going to keep his promises. And he's always close. He's always faithful. So if we can understand this, joy is about God, not us. Nehemiah 8.10. They're building a wall, right? And these guys are giving them all kinds of trouble. Nehemiah is up on the wall. They're trying to build the wall to surround Jerusalem so they can begin to rebuild the city because it had been attacked. They had sinned. They had made some mistakes. And God allowed the enemy to overtake the city. And they come back and they start rebuilding the city. 
And there were some critics. Anybody ever had any critics? He kind of said, oh, Fox could knock that wall down. That's the weakest wall I've ever seen. And they began to try to distract them and discourage them. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, he said this, Go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of, so whose joy is my strength? Is it my joy? It's the Lord's joy. Now, where does joy come from? It's a fruit of the Spirit. So again, it's important that we develop a relationship with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit, because that is our source of joy. How can we have joy in difficult circumstances? Uh, back in 2010-ish, early on, our church was going through a great deal of turmoil. And I was in the eye of the hurricane. There was a nice-sized faction of the church that wanted me gone. And I remember it was the Sunday for this guy to candidate. Here's the way they set it up. Okay, I'm just being, being me. They set it up where they would candidate two people at once because it required a two-thirds majority, or I'm sorry, a, yeah, a three-quarters majority for a pastor to be elected. If you run two candidates, that makes that impossible. I knew this. God knew this. So they bring this candidate in. They made me take all my pictures and study material out of the office, put it in a box, put it in my vehicle, and they told me I could not come to church that weekend. So Beth and I go to find a church, and we struggle with it, can't find anywhere, end up missing church that Sunday. Um, we tried to get in several churches, and just it, nothing. Seemed, one of them was closed that day. It was like the pastor just said, "Hey, we're going out of town. Uh, good luck." Uh, uh, seriously, that's seriously what happened. And then another one, they were having multiple services, and we could not get in the parking lot. So finally, time passed. We've missed Sunday twice. We've missed church twice in my life since I've been saved. Comes time for the election, and they tell us that we can't come to the business meeting. So I'm pretty anxious. We're stuck, holed up in my office. And they're in there voting on our future. And, of course, we knew. We got voted out. And I remember when the board member came in, his face was downcast because he was on our side. He wanted us to get the church. And, and you know, it was sad. But, you know, I never lost my joy because my joy wasn't dependent on my position here. Now, ultimately, we know that God turned things around in a hurry. But I share that story to tell you, you can find joy in the most devastating. I, not only had I just lost my church family, I lost my job all in the same day. I was devastated. I did not know what to do. I didn't know how to put in a resume for a senior pastor. I'd never been a senior pastor before. I'd been a youth pastor. I had no idea if I was going to get any, get any interviews. I, I did not know what to do. So the only thing I did is I was like, God, your joy. Your joy is my strength. I don't need good circumstances to have joy. I refuse to give in to a bad attitude. I refuse to feel sorry for myself. I refuse to give in to this thinking. I am going to keep my joy. And the next service, we had a service called Seven Ways to Praise. I didn't preach. We danced the entire service. We threw down the band, and I mean, we danced. all. I had no idea God was about to come through and change everything, which I, I'll save that story for another day. But I believe God honored the fact that I recognized his joy was my strength, not my position, not my church family. I love you all. But if you all were the source of my joy, I would have no joy today because most of you aren't here. My joy is in him. And the only reason I share that story is because I know some of you have had some devastating things happen. I felt like my world had fallen apart. Had no idea what to do. But I had this reservoir of joy inside of me, knowing that, you know what? God still loves me. Some of you all need to say that when you're tempted to give in to despair. God still loves me. 
God still extends grace to me even when I make mistakes. God blesses me. He keeps his promises to me, and he's near me at all times because he's faithful. Some of you need to declare that over yourself. Lord, you love me. You give me grace. You bless me. You keep your promises. You're close to me, and you're faithful. Don't care about my circumstances. Lord, I'm going to trust you in the midst of my circumstances, and I'm going to have joy in the middle of it. Because how many times have you heard of Christians having a bad day? And it would have been easy for me to do that next Sunday. Everybody knew I got voted out. It's really funny. I said, but we want you to stay and preach a few Sundays till we get this figured out. Now, what I wanted to say is, hey, suck, let's figure it out. I'm out. Right? But no, I'm going to maintain. I'm serious. I'm a human being with real feelings, and sometimes they want to come out, and I have to say, nope. I'm going to walk in joy. I'm going to walk in joy. I'm going to extend joy. And I tell you what, I had the best time that Sunday. I had the best time. It was so much fun. And it was just like, it's going to be okay. I don't care what happens, it's going to be okay. Don't know if any of you have ever felt like you lost your church family and your job in the same day, but it's not fun. But I had joy. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to depend on my circumstances to bring me joy. I can depend on the Holy Spirit living inside of me, that's pouring love inside of me through the Holy Spirit, I can have joy. So can you. No matter the circumstances, no matter what you're dealing with. John 10, or John 15, I'm sorry, 10 through 15. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as my father's, or just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. His love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. So notice Jesus talks about three things here. Number one, a willingness to obey. Right? If you love me, keep my commandments. The second thing that he talks about is love. Specifically, loving others. Right? He says, love one another as I have loved you. And he talks about joy. And here's what I believe can help you grow in joy. Number one, do what God says. You realize you cannot have joy in your life if you're disobedient. Disobedient does, disobedience does something to your confidence. Does that make sense? If you're living a disobedient life, it wrecks your confidence. It's like, God, are we okay? You don't have to answer that question if you're obeying him. Now, sometimes your first act of obedience is repentance. Amen, God, I blew it. I'm sorry. Help me. But any other thing is how can I have joy? Loving others. Putting the needs of others before myself. You know another reason why I had joy in the midst of the trial? It's because I told myself, Lord, I know that I've given everything to this congregation. I know that I've put them before myself. I know that I have allowed personal suffering to protect them. I never use the pulpit to air out the dirty laundry of the church. I always use it to encourage, Lord, I know I have walked, I know I've obeyed your commandments. And I know I've loved these people so I can have joy. Don't let joy suckers get a hold of you. Don't give in to these things and don't lash out at people. Remember, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's gentle. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It doesn't rejoice when you fail. It doesn't insist in its own way. God, I want your will. Anybody have any questions or any insight? I know I've kind of dropped some heavy stuff tonight because, you know, I, I like to talk about my life because of two reasons. Number one, I want to bring myself down in your eyes. I never want you to elevate me to a place to where I have this super status. And another thing is I want you to realize that once I bring myself down, that you can overcome the same things that I do. 
But my joy is not dependent on my circumstances. Praise the Lord. Remember our text in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 11. The beauty of being a vine or a branch in the vine of Christ is that we're growing in love. So if you blew it yesterday, don't worry about it. Get back on track and say, God, I'm walking in love today because it's all an opportunity to grow. Becoming more and more like him. Lord, I'm growing. I'm getting better. I believe it's Joyce Meyer that says, I'm not where I ought to be, but I'm not where I used to be. You know what? I am nowhere near I want to, where I want to be. But man, I'm not that guy that I used to be. Praise God. I have more joy today than I did at any point in my life at this point. I believe I've got more love today than I have in any other point in my life to this point. I have more peace, which we'll talk about, and more gentleness. And boy, I tell you, that's a tough one. I'm not a very gentle person. I have more kindness. I have more goodness. I have more self-control. I have more patience. <sighs> Help me, Jesus. Anybody else, uh, that's one you work harder on. I am impatient. My wife reminds me sometimes. I get behind a car. He's going 20 miles an hour in a 35-mile-an-hour zone, and I'm like, dude, there's 15 more miles you got in there. If you could use it, I'd probably get to my destination on time, please. And then to make up for it, I speed, and then I'm breaking the law, and then it's, yeah. It's the other person's fault, though, right? I'm going to ask everybody to stand. My prayer today is that maybe you have a better understanding of love and you have a better understanding of joy. Because can I tell you something about the fruit of the Spirit? It's going to get tested. And it's going to get tested sometimes by the people closest to you. You ever heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt? And basically what that means is the closer you are to somebody, the more you let your guard down the more real you are to that person, and the more apt you are to say something hurtful. And our spouses fall in that category. So before you talk, before you lash out, have a quick conversation with the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I want to produce your fruit. I want to produce the, word, uh, the, the works of the flesh. One of the works of the flesh is strife. Living in a state of conflict. You ever notice there's some people, they thrive in conflict? It's like whenever there's a fight breaking out, what do they do? They all run to it and get their phones out. What? Somebody picks, posted a video on Facebook of some old man getting beat up in Louisville. Like, how about you put your stupid phone down and protect the guy? You know, where is the love in this world? It better be in the church. It better be in you. I hope it's growing. Father, in Jesus' name, redeem the time today. Lord, help us to recognize that we need to walk in love and walk in joy. Lord, help us to recognize that love and joy are not dependent on circumstances. They are independent of our circumstances. We can have love. We can have joy in the midst of hate, in the midst of anger, in the midst of strife. We can have a smile knowing that the joy of the Lord is my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you on Sunday. Have a great evening. Stay dry.